boys and girls, Kismet, KismetFishing.com with Hollis Walker Smith here. You see he's got his first fishing pole in his hand there. We are so pleased to announce that after doing the mom's video, Hollis got reached out to, so the nice folks at MEPS, and you see he's got his jersey on there. Uh-oh, you dropped your rod. The nice folks at MEPS reached out and gave Hollis his first official sponsorship deal. Check it out. It's amazing. They sent him this great pack. We've got lots of little MEPS spinners. We got feathers on them. Look, this one's got fish. Look, it's got a fish on it. We got fish. We got catalogs so we can order what we need. So, Hollis Walker Smith, yeah, baby. First official sponsorship deal. The youngest ever, he'll be six months old tomorrow. The youngest ever, I think, professional fishing deal anybody's ever gotten. And he says, he's so excited. Hey guys, uh, the baby magically disappeared for a second because I want to talk about something that I didn't know. So this, the whole MEPS spinner thing came out of the rooster tail video. And I was having a conversation with the national sales manager for them based upon this video. And uh, he said, you, you realize that there's a big difference between what you were throwing and, and what MEPS is. And I said, no. So this is really interesting to me. I, I didn't know any of this. So uh, the MEPS baits are made in, they're all put together in Wisconsin, made here, uh, put together here in America. Uh, it's a German wire, stainless steel wire that makes the, the bait, the, the main part of the bait. There's three machined brass parts in every bait. It's a really high quality hook. They're designed so that no matter how fast you pull them, they won't collapse. They continue to spin. And every, all the feathers on them are all natural. They're either squirrel or bucktail. So there's no artificial um, uh, material in any of the tails on them. So I was actually impressed having found out about that because as he and I were talking about, I'm not sure this doesn't, on those really tough days, just based on the little bit I've done this, doesn't become something I don't fall back on when I really need a keeper. And that's probably not going to happen on Rayburn or Toledo, but some of the other East Texas lakes, it really gets tough, super high pressure. This may be something I go to. So I just thought that was interesting that there is a significant quality difference between MUPS and kind of everything else you might buy on the uh, on the lure aisle at your uh, at your local wherever. Uh, by the way, I'm going to put up a link to a couple of these things. So if you guys want to pick a few up, uh, you'll be able to pick them up in the link below. So there you go. Back to the video, or I guess we're still on the video, but back to the other part. Okay, so I do have a video for you guys this week. By the way, don't forget uh, Bass Champs on Belton this weekend. If you're in Central Texas, make sure if you're in a Skeeter that you go and pay your real money fee to Skeeter because there's a whole bunch of money. There's over $9,000 of extra money available in that tournament. That's right, Hollis, so don't forget. Um, so I had an opportunity. I was on the north end of Raven the other day, and I happened to bump into a game board. Uh, uh, Warden James Barge, who actually is from the Zavala area, or, or lives in the Zavala area, and we had a great visit. I just, I had a lot of questions for him, so I've got about 10 or 15 minutes of this interview. Unfortunately, I recorded it in three parts, and the last part, my mic somehow got very slightly unhooked, and the audio is scrambled, so we didn't get to talk about um, the, uh, the, the life jacket deal. But I've already reached out to him. He was He's a super nice guy. He said he's glad to re-record the end of this video talking about life jackets. But I thought what I might also do, as we've done in the past with you guys, is I would just throw it out there for you. And, and if you have questions you'd like to ask a Texas game warden specific to fishing, I don't want to get into hunting because I'm not that big a hunter. But give me a comment below or shoot me an email at kensmithfishing at outlook.com. You guys know how to reach me right there. Uh, shoot me a message, what you want me to ask uh, warden, the warden, and I will ask him on camera. So we'll get back down there in the next few weeks, and we're going to reconnect and film the rest of the end of this, talking specifically about those inflatable life jackets and a couple of other things. But I hope you enjoy this. I really, really appreciate him taking about 15 minutes out of his day and visiting with me, actually maybe a little longer than that. We, we kind of talked about a bunch of fun stuff. So uh, here we go. Let's, uh, let's meet... Uh, Warden James Barge, and uh, say again, and talk a little bit about fishing. Thanks, guys. All right, guys. Hey, guys. So, Jan uh, Officer Jan Officer, how do y'all 
Warden, game warden. Warden James Barge pulled up on me and we got to talking about some stuff today. Uh, so one of the things, there's a new law from 2019 and it's about kill switches. So talk about that. Well, any anybody that's operating a vessel at a speed greater than headway speed, greater than idle speed, if they're in a boat less than 26 feet in length, has got to have a kill switch lanyard on attached to the motor to kill it if you if you fall out of the boat or one of the wireless devices that we have that provides the same function. If that boat motor came with that from the factory, then it's got to be used. So that's a, a finable or a, a, that you can write them a, a ticket and Absolutely. probably should because they ought to have it on. Absolutely. I mean, the, you know, the kill switch is there for a good reason. We've had officers, it's been mandatory that Texas Game Wardens have to, for them to wear their kill switches for quite some time. No kidding, and so it's it, yeah, it's in yeah. your rules that you have yeah. to wear it. We, we, we're we ahead of the curve. Sure. We've been wearing it before it was allowed. Yeah. And you know, the reason that we wear it is because we believe it saves lives. Sure, yeah, and, and off camera, we talked about the fact that you've had to notify people that you've recovered their family member. Absolutely, and that's, you know, that's one of the, the downsides of this job is having to to go and see a grieving family and, and let them know that their loved one is is not going to be coming home. Yeah, awful. So we talked a little bit about different types of life jackets. Now you said if somebody has one of these on and it's blown up and they've just stuffed it back in there, Yeah. that's yeah. no longer a legal life jacket? Not until you service it. There's You have to replace the, the, CO2 cartridge. the CO2 cartridge and whatever it is that makes that thing trigger. You know, some of them have the the little round wafer in them that dissolves when it gets wet right? Yep. and it lets that needle spear that, that CO2 cartridge to inflate it. All of that has to be replaced before that's a serviceable life jacket again. If, if you come across your life jacket in one of your boxes and it's been deployed, you can't just fold it up and go on to the lake uh, because it's not a serviceable life jacket at that point. It's not going to inflate, it's not going to help you at all. And if we come across you wearing a life jacket in that condition, then you can be cited for not having enough life jackets on board if that was one of the ones that you were counting on as your number. So I have to have a personal flotation device for everybody in the boat and a throw cushion. You have to have a throw cushion for a boat if it's 16 feet or longer. Okay, all right. And then let's also talk about kids. So what's the law in Texas for kids? A child under 13 has to have a life jacket on by law unless that vessel is anchored aground or made fast to the shore. So if you're out here in the middle of the lake and you've got your trolling motor down and you're, you're trolling and fishing along, that child still needs to have that life jacket on. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're anchored out, if you're tied up to a stump where your, your position is sure and if the child falls out, your boat's not gonna run off and, right. and leave him where you got time to get him back in, then that's entirely different. But unless that boat is stationary, that child under 13's got to have a life jacket on. Interesting. All right, so the other thing I ask you about that, that I saw it the other day, it frustrates me to pieces. I see people running with and I, kids, adults, in the chair on the front deck. Yes, yeah, that's a, that's a really dangerous situation uh, because what's going to happen when that, when that person is sitting up here on, this, on a pedestal seat on this front deck and that big engine's running, when it hits a stump, and, and Rayburn, which is where we're at today, is full of stumps. And a lot of them are just under the surface, but when that boat hits that stump and that person goes over the nose of that boat and then that boat continues to move forward, uh, that person that just got thrown out of the front of the boat is gonna wind up in a prop. And you know, that's three or four blades turning fast that are just chopping as they go and that can turn into a fatality accident. It's gonna kill you. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's the same thing with kids sitting on the front of a pontoon boat outside the railing with their feet dangling in the water. We, you know, that is a situation that has caused fatalities in Texas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was out of Blake one time when that was a fatality accident. Most awful thing. It is. So you've got a rope tied to your front cleat over there. I do. Tell yeah. me why. Well, I ain't as young as I used to be, and <laughs> I, I probably ain't as healthy as I ought to be either. So if, if I find... All right, we had a camera shut off, so he, uh, James is explaining why he's got that, that rope tied on the front. Well, if I find myself in a situation where, where for whatever reason, I'm outside of my boat in, in deep water where I can't get back in, I can take that rope that I've got tied to this front cleat and run it back to my back cleat and let it dangle down in the water. 
and uh, get a hold of the side of my boat and get my feet up on that rope and sideways step down that rope until the point as I come out of the water where I can roll myself back into my boat I mean, if I'm by myself and do a self-rescue. It's obvious, guys, with the physical ability, you and I could just pull ourselves oh, back yeah, in because we're yeah. so strong. Obviously. But, I mean, but... You know, the, I might have somebody else For the average man me. who can't right, do... Right, right. <laughs> might have... Somebody else might use my boat that's not... In the, there, There is no me. way if I fell out of this boat right now and I didn't have a ladder, I could climb back in this boat. I can in the summertime, but with what I have on, there's no way I could do Well, that. and that's something else that you need to be mindful of out here. You know, we're out here in January. This water is cold. 54 what, how, degrees. How much? 54. 54 degrees. So you're not going to have long in this water that you're going to be able to use all the muscles that you got. That's right. At some point, your muscle use is going to going to go south, and you're just going to be there at, at the mercy of, of somebody hopefully coming to find you. So... The faster you're able to get out of this water, uh, the more likely your chance of survival is. So if y'all didn't see that video, I'll post it again right here. You know how I do this. That hypothermia video I did the other day. So in 54 degree water, I, if I remember the numbers right, you might have 15 to 30 minutes that you still have kind of your faculties about you and some amount of strength to get yourself somewhere. Yeah, and, and, and I don't know the numbers on that, but you know, another thing that we talked about in with life jackets was the different kinds. Yep. Today, I, I came to the lake with a different kind of life jacket on than what I've got on right now, and it was this life jacket right here. This is a this is a float coat that we're issued. It's a, it's a coat, but it's a life jacket also. It's got foam inside of it. It's a very warm coat. As a matter of fact, I got hot in it earlier, moving around my boat talking to other folks so I had to go and pull this off and put on a regular jacket in a, in a regular PFD so that I wasn't hot and sweating inside this but I would think that if you wound up in the water this would probably lengthen the amount of time until your exposure through hypothermia would cause right. you heartache. Yep. Uh, one other thing because I got in trouble about this myself one time with a game warden. Talk about fire extinguishers. Okay, any boat that, that has double bottoms that aren't completely sealed and filled with flotation, permanently installed fuel tanks, or a compartment where combustible materials may be stored has got to have a fire extinguisher on board. Now, here's the problem that we run into. We'll, we'll run up on a fella in a nice boat that's out here fishing. Uh, happened to me just earlier today has a, a good looking boat he's a really nice guy he's out here pre-fishing for a tournament next weekend i go through my water safety inspection i take a look at his fire extinguisher and it's discharged the needle shows that it that it needs to be replaced and he's never used it he's never used yep. it That's says what he to me. just he just looked at it a, uh, a little while ago now of course as i get older a little while ago might have been two days it might have <laughs> been two months yeah, uh, that. and and you know in this type of weather uh it gets cold and and the the aerosol in that stuff i would think would it wouldn't create the pressure just like you lose pressure in your tires yep. the air all the air molecules are still there but it's colder now yeah. so you're losing pressure and and now this fire extinguisher is not serviceable all right dang it don't write me a ticket if mine's bad okay i'll well I, I'll, I'll try to just write you a warning if i have to <laughs> we'll go ahead and look nope i'm charged okay i good, feel good, good. now you kind of got me worried, I think, hey, about that. And another thing, you need to know how to check the fire extinguisher that you have in your boat. You know, there are a couple of different, different mechanisms that fire extinguisher manufacturers use to show that that, that fire extinguisher is charged. Obviously, the easiest one is the gauge. That's what that one is. That's either pointing in the green or in the red, so it's either good or it's not. Uh, another one is you'll have a little horseshoe looking thing up on top of it under the button that you mash to discharge it. The way we'll check that is first you got to make sure that that, that little mm -hmm. keeper is under there. Then you mash the button down until it sets down on top of that and you let it go and if it pops back up it's good. If it don't then you have to replace it. And then a third type that I see out here a lot, it's got a little green pin that sticks out the front of it. And you push that green pin in and if it comes back out then it's good if you push it in there and it stays or if you pull it out and it's disappeared up in there then that that fire extinguisher is not serviceable and it's going to have to be replaced so i, I will share with y'all i have had a boat catch on fire i was changing batteries out i mashed a uh i mashed an inline fuse during the day it got hot 
set, <laughs> set the boat on fire. That ain't good. It is not good because there ain't nowhere to go. No, but, uh, but, especially this time of the year. Oh, That's man. why I stress fire extinguishers because you either got two choices when your boat's on fire. You can try to put it out or you can get in the water. Well, and, and this was, time getting in the water ain't your best Well, option. and it was this far from 40 gallons of fuel. Yeah, that ain't good either. So I, don't just make sure your fire extinguisher is charged. Know where it is. Absolutely. I, I get a lot older out here sometimes sitting waiting on somebody to find their fire extinguisher. I know mine. I, you saw, I opened it up and looked right at it. I know where my fire extinguisher is, and I know where it is because I've had to use absolutely and you know things unfortunately as as people a lot of times things aren't important to us until they're important to us that's right that's right got a boat running by yeah hey, if he on. knew what this looked like when there was about three foot less water in this lake he probably would have been going I, I, I run this stuff and i just run it fuckers up.